Okay, so now that that's all done, actually we should go back to z version zero here. Make this green for effect. And let's do the actual reconstruction of our building. So let's put a geometry node and say construct. And because we, again, as I started to say last chapter, because we, we laid so much groundwork, this is actually gonna be almost trivial, fairly trivial anyway. Maybe I shouldn't say that. That seems like I'm just jinxing myself. At any rate, go to our layout, grab the output, because you know this is what we want to convert into our new thing. So grab that, we'll do an add, which paradoxically will remove everything. We click delete challenge, but keep the points. So there they are. These are the points that were all at the center of each of these things that we're gonna replace. So we have the points, the points know what they used to be. I'm gonna turn off this group viewing stuff where we say, uh, oh, it's gone anyway. No group attributes. Anyway, part name. This is a thing that tells each point what it used to be. And that's what we're gonna access out of our fractures area over here. So how are we actually gonna do that? Well, there's this thing called the instance SOP. Now, in our case, we talk a lot about instances in our rigid body sim, and that's still gonna be true. But at this moment, we're actually only gonna instance the entire collection at a time. Because remember, when we were in here, we ended with this RBD packed thing. So it ended up only being three packed geos. What the three are is high res is all one package, constraints are all one package, and the proxy is all one package. So that's why it says three, even though it's really essentially like one asset. So it's that asset that we want to instance, and then we will open that up later on to get to the individual instances inside. In any case, the instance here wants an instance path attribute. As you can see, hopefully, from the tooltip text, which is not showing up. Oh, there it is. Either we can have the path point to a file on disk, or it can be a string that starts with op colon, operator reference. What that simply means is not a path in the disk, but a path in Houdini to a certain node. Certainly we're used to dealing with those by now. So we need to build paths that point to these fractures, or really it points to these out nodes per fracture. So that shouldn't be too bad, right? Let's make a primitive, or rather a point wrangler, which if I haven't said before, is no different than an attribute wrangler. If I say attribute wrangler, put it here, you can say they're the same. So, take one of these. So what was it, instant path? So s at, because it's a string, instant path. What does it equal? Well, it equals op colon, we know that. And then it's gonna be plus, and I'm gonna make a, a string parameter that's gonna get us to that, that fracture subnetwork. I'll just call it a fracture path. And then it's gonna be that plus backslash, then the part name that it, the point already has, and then the out node inside of it. So if I look, rather, I can't look at that yet. Let me move the display here to drag this out a little bit longer. If I click on this, and I literally put the fracture path in here, so this is gonna replace that. If I look at the instance path, I'm gonna click this button here for a minute to make it big. You can see I've literally constructed a Houdini path to the different instances, the different things that I want to repeat. The glass window out, the concrete wall out, all that jazz. So hopefully, if I get lucky, ta-da, ta-da. Wow, pretty cool, right? It's almost right. It's so close to being right. What don't we have? Well, we don't have the scaling. That scaling that we applied, when we did this, and we made these bigger, and that's because if you're familiar with copy to points, a very common node we use in Houdini, 
Copy to points uses a bunch of different attributes. Uh-oh, there it goes. <laughs> I was gonna say before it crashed, in fact, let's just get rid of this now. Um, it uses a bunch of attributes that happen in a lot of Houdini contexts. So copy to points uses it, the instancing thing uses it, because actually there's a copy to stamps points inside of it. But anyway, you'll see a lot of these attributes come up a lot. Up vectors, uh, N scale for the size for the other thing, orientation for, or orient rather, for the orientation. There's a bunch of stuff that is recognized here under copy and instancing point attributes. And that's what we're going to need to do. Currently, we only have P. P is the position. So sure, it was able to put everything onto the positions. But there was no scale. There was neither scale. There was neither P scale, which is the uniform scale. Uh-oh, get out of here, Duolingo. There's neither the P scale or the regular non-uniform vector scale, which can have a different value for the X, a Y, and the Z. And you recall, that's what we did here. We did a different scales on different axes. So we need to make a actual scale vector that has that, that captures it. So here we are, back before our add, back when these were still packed primitives. Now, you might recall, we were just talking about prim intrinsics. If we go over to primitives here, now there's no closed because we're dealing with packed geometry, which is a different set of prim intrinsics. One of the most famous ones is the packed full transform. Packed full transform, as you can see, is 16 different, so 0 to 15, 16 different numbers, which is, of course, a 4x4 four four matrix, which we talked about a lot in Rigid's 1. So hopefully you saw that. But suffice to say, that transform stores the location, the rotation, and the scale and also the shear, but nobody cares about that. Now the scale is what we want, and we're not gonna get it pretty much any other way. So we need to deal with this intrinsic to make the attribute that the instancer uses. I wish you could just feed in the packed uh, pieces into the instancer and it would look at the packed full transform, but it doesn't matter what I want. So v at scale. So it's gonna be a vector attribute. So we need to get, well, let's actually start before that. Let's make a matrix M. So matrix is that four by four, and we need to do prim intrinsic again, just like we did before with the closed thing. And just like before, it's zero, incoming geometry, packed full transform, oopsies, uh, our current point that we're dealing with, and well, that's actually it. So we have it now. We have that matrix. It's stored in M. Conveniently, there is a vex function called cracked or crack transform. This will, instead of making us do matrix math, we can just pass the matrix into this and ask for something back. If you look at the card for that, there's a lot going on here, but it's not as hard as you think if you just stick to mostly the defaults. First argument is TRS, which means translate rotation scale. When you deal with transforms, you might want it to scale first, then do a rotation or whatever. If we just put zero in here, it'll be the default. Same thing here. We'll write rotation. You could rotate around the Z axis first, and then the X axis or whatever. If we just put a zero in here, just do the default. The only one that we're really that interested in is the C. Returns the translate when C is zero, rotation when it's one, or the scale when it's two. That's what we want, it's a scale. So we'll definitely put a two here. The pivot, again, can just default to zero, zero, zero. We don't care. Um, and that's it. And then after that, we put the matrix in. So, crack transform, zero, zero, two, because we want the scale. We'll do zero, this little, with the curly braces, meaning we're passing in the vector zero, zero, zero. And then finally, the M matrix that we actually got in the first place. And that's it. So now we've stored the scale of the packed pieces here. And if we go to our instance now, it works. Ta-da. If we disable it, it goes away. And you can see it totally works. So that's pretty rad.
Now there's still, you know, there's only 149 points here because there was only 149 of the actual things to instance in the first place. You know, each one of these was is a point. So even after this, there's still only that. So we need to do an unpack first. Believe it or not, it actually packed. Each one of these got packed up. And go to hide other objects again. So we we did an RBD pack here, which took all of our little pieces and put it into you know this container. But then this container actually got packed again by the instancer here. So at least doing the unpack here will undo that and get us back to the RBD pack land. All of our color went away, so let's make sure that we are transferring the color down, so CD. We also want to make sure we have all of our part attribute stuff. So there we go, part name and part type because of the asterisk. Very good. And the last layer we want to do, once we can see this RBD type primitive adder, that means we're back down to the RBD pack thing here, which means we can now do an RBD unpack. We need this attribute in order for this to work. And let it think for a minute. Now, if I middle click and hold, you see there's 15,000 pieces. Once again, we need the color to transfer down, and we still want, well, I guess this is actually only gonna be a visualization of how many pieces are in there. Really, the output of our construct is, is just gonna be this. But while we're here, RBD exploded view, and let's just revel in what we've made here. Look at all those pieces, crazy. Turn off show proxy geometry, we don't care right now. But look at all those pieces. They look kind of weird though. They're kind of bunching up in an odd way. I wonder why that might be. If we look at the RBD unpack, we do have our, all of our 15,000 pieces. But unfortunately, if we look at the names of them, a lot of them have the same name. Look at that. Quite a few of them have the same name, and they shouldn't, because these are the packed pieces themselves. These are not the polygons inside of them. A lot of these have the same name, and why wouldn't they? You know, they had their names here, or rather, I guess here, when we made them they had these names. But now we've duplicated these pieces so many times so that they've duplicated the names too. So just like we did in Ridges 1, we need to, let's find it again. Where's our name thing? We need to click on RBD Unpack and say, enforce unique name attributes per instance. And you'll see it'll add another number at the end of it. There we go. So now, for each of the 149 of these things, you'll see you'll have that number going up at the end. And now, these pieces are totally unique. And furthermore, that, is, that will also make them spread out correctly. Oops, I turned it off. That'll actually make them blow up correctly here as well. Because now that they actually have unique names, they'll all move in a unique direction. So that's super rad. 15,000 pieces, and we didn't really need to fracture that many of them. As you can imagine, I could go to piece version here, and go to all the way up to two. So you have to think about that for a moment, but not too bad. And we'll see how many pieces we get, and there you go. Way more pieces now. Apparently 53,000 pieces. But not bad, you know, it's not, really straining too hard to work on these, and these are the high-res pieces. So that is a good sign for things to come. I'm gonna go back to zero for now, though. So that's awesome. We're doing it. Then the next chapter, still in this unit, though, we wanna say we recognize that the fracture pattern on here, though, is still the same on each face. We can at least flip these things over or flip them around 
to expose different, the fracture pattern on the one side is different than the other, or we can at least rotate it to the top, just something to vary it up a little bit more.